On behalf of the McLean Center for Medical Ethics, I want to welcome you to today's lecture in our series on ethical issues in end-of-life care. Next Wednesday, Professor Alan Meisel, director of the Center for Bioethics and Health Law at the University of Pittsburgh, will speak on the lack of consensus about futility. I hope you'll be able to attend ne next week's lecture. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Daniel Salmacy. Dr. Salmacy is the Kilbride Clinton Professor of Medicine and Ethics in the Department of Medicine and Divinity School at the University of Chicago, where he serves as Associate Director of the McLean Center for Med Clinical Medical Ethics and as Director of the Program on Medicine and Religion. He has previously held faculty positions at New York Medical College and at Georgetown University. He received his bachelor's and medical degrees from Cornell University, completed his residency and postdoctoral fellowship in general internal medicine at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and holds a PhD in philosophy from Georgetown University. He has served on numerous governmental advisory committees and was appointed to the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues by President Obama in 2010. His research interests encompass both theoretical and empirical investigations of the ethics of end-of-life decision-making, ethics, education, and spirituality in medicine. He has published extensively and serves as editor-in-chief of the Journal of Theoretical Medicine and Bioethics. Today, Dr. Salmacy will speak on voluntary stopping eating and drinking, separating the wheat from the chaff. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Daniel Salmacy. Thanks, uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks to all of you for, uh, for coming. I guess no, no prophet is without honor uh, except in his native, uh, native land. Um, uh, we, I see we switched from uh, La Petite Folie to Potbelly for my, uh, for my lecture. So. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I'm going to talk to you about, as uh, Monica suggested, about voluntarily stopping eating and, uh, and drinking. Um, uh, some uh, preliminaries about this. This is, uh, in contrast to a lot of other talks in this series, this is more of a work in, uh, in progress. Um, uh, basically, it was uh, outlined on the plane to San Diego, and uh, the slides were made on the way back from San Diego, and there's no, no text yet, so uh, I'm looking for uh, feedback. Um, the topic is controversial. Uh, Certainly we're doing some controversial ones, probably this one uh, more so. Um, uh, rather than a sort of overview of the issues, I'm going to try to give you a sustained um, uh, ethical argument. Um, and uh, despite the fact that the really hot button issue underneath all of this is questions about the ethics of assisted suicide, I'm going to prescind from uh, any judgment uh, precisely about that question. Um, my aims are to try to define this practice of voluntarily stopping eating and drinking for you very carefully, um, to argue that uh, VSED, um, as it's even called in the literature, um, is actually a form of suicide, uh, and that for a physician to assist a patient with voluntarily stopping eating and drinking is a form then of physician-assisted suicide, and therefore the conditional argument is that if if physician-assisted suicide is wrong, then physician assistance with voluntary stopping eating and drinking is also wrong. So it's a um, simple uh, um, logical framework to the, uh, to the, uh, to the argument. Um, you know, I think that careful uh, answers to questions like this require from us some careful thinking. Maybe it'll be too heavy for you to do while you're having lunch. I hope that's not the, uh, the case. I'm going to try to be clear to you about what my assumptions are, try to work uh, towards some definitions, um, uh, uh, talk about what it means to be complicit um, in someone else's wrongdoing. Um, and I want, at the end, even though there's a lot of logic here, to uh, try to make it clear to you that being clear in one's thinking is not incompatible with being a caring person or a caring healthcare professional. I mean, there's sometimes that sort of bias out there that if I'm going to make a logical argument like this, it necessarily means I don't really care about patients. I do care about my patients, and I hope those of you who know me as a practitioner recognize that that's true. I also sort of want, in any of the talks I give about um, um, whether it's withdrawing a feeding tube or withholding a feeding tube for someone with Alzheimer's disease or this kind of question, 
to, to situate it um, in a larger context of the sort of meanings of human eating. Um, it's not just nutrition and hydration, um, at least for us. Um, you're eating now, but I would suggest that part of what you're doing is more than just uh, eating. Um, I guess the fat in the, uh, 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 the food you're getting from pot belly may help to increase the pleasure and satisfaction of what you're doing. And there's also something interpersonal. Um, maybe like me, you uh, often have uh, the, the danger during lunch of getting the crumbs on your keyboard. Um, but it's good to be able to do that with other people. And we try to do that with our families um, and communicate with each other through preparing meals and sharing them with each other um, and eating. And that's uh, the, the real context for the human meaning uh, of eating. Um, some assumptions to start with, um, and so you know where I'm coming at from this. Um, first, there are those people who think that, um, uh, that somehow uh, uh, medical interventions um, are for around feeding are not somehow medical interventions. I don't uh, believe that. Uh, the insertion of feeding tubes, peripheral or central venous catheters, even enterocolysis. I think all of these things are medical interventions and not simply means of facilitating normal human eating. Um, so I'm on the side of those who say these are medical interventions. It's not just sort of assisting normal human eating. Um, and I also want to say from the outset that while I'm uh, going to be uh, talking about this very particular case, um, I fully support the withholding of medical hydration and nutrition um, and these kinds of invasive uh, means um, from decisionally capable persons who refuse these interventions and that in most cases, I think um, uh, those are perfectly morally acceptable um, practices. But the issue I want to address um, is that it's been argued that this practice of voluntarily stopping eating and drinking a is somehow not suicide, that it's different from suicide, um, and that further physicians have a moral obligation to respect these decisions and cannot insert a feeding tube in such patients, and I think most of us would have qualms about that. But then further to say that physicians also have a moral obligation to assist a patient who voluntarily stops um, eating and drinking, and that such aid doesn't constitute physician-assisted suicide. And um, the people who've put this kind of argument in the literature include prominently uh, uh, Tim Quill, who's going to be here uh, speaking in a few weeks. Um, also philosophers like uh, Bernard Gert have made similar, uh, similar arguments. Um, and I want to, those are the questions I want to examine, whether that line of reasoning is actually sustainable if we're careful about our uh, understanding. So the kind of case we're talking about, just so it's clear for everybody, um, 75-year-old woman who's been having memory problems, has recently been diagnosed with likely Alzheimer's uh, uh, dementia. Um, she states she cannot bear um, the possibility of inexorable cognitive decline that she foresees for herself. And she states that she intends to stop eating and drinking um, as a means of bringing about her, uh, uh, hastening her death. And she asks to be admitted to the hospital and to be sedated um, uh, as she does so. Um, um, and this is the kind of case that's being presented um, as voluntarily stopping in eating and drinking um, and something that might be distinct from a suicide or for the physician's aid, physician-assisted suicide. So let's try to be, um, examine these kinds of claims. <clears throat> when do I hold that it's typically morally acceptable to withhold um, medical hydration and nutrition? Well, the typical cases that I think most of us um, are used to are when a patient is dying of an underlying lethal pathophysiologic condition, whether that's a malignancy or in stages of a neurologic disease like uh, uh, um, ALS or Alzheimer's disease, when a person's unable to swallow um, uh, on their own, bed bound, um, un, uh, um, and under those sorts of circumstances where there's a progression of, uh, expected for that disease. Um, and secondly, um, and importantly, where there is a f pathophysiological reason why the patient cannot eat or can eat only with grave difficulty or at high risk to their own well-being. So those kinds of cases might uh, include obstruction, obviously, 
um, often include uh, neuromuscular dysfunction, either neurologically or at the muscular level, or a pathophysiologic condition of anorexia. Um, as accompanies most chronic illnesses at the end of life, um, persons who um, are dying of untreated uh, tuberculosis um, or let's say it's multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, those persons are going to have high circulating levels of cachexin and are going to lose their appetite. Um, people who have cancer at the end stages of that disease lose their appetites as a normal part of the pathophysiology of this ongoing progressive disease and those persons um, have a pathophysiologic reason why um, they are not um, eating. Um, so persons dying of an underlying disease, there's a reason why they cannot eat. And either the intervention won't work, and I'm among those who would argue that in end stages of Alzheimer's disease, the typical reasons we give for putting in feeding tubes really aren't addressed typically by those feeding tubes, if it's uh, to prevent somebody from uh, having uh, uh, aspiration pneumonia, uh, then in fact it's rare that that would be the case because particularly if it's very end stages and the patient's lying uh, flat on the bed, the food you put in the tube in their stomach is going to go right back up the esophagus and down um, into their lungs uh, anyway, so it doesn't really um, uh, help that. Or it isn't reasonably available. I mean, no one is saying we have an obligation to put feeding tubes into people in uh, the develop, developing world where these sorts of things aren't um, reasonably available. Or we've judged that the burdens of this sort of treatment um, outweigh the benefits for a patient, again, with a short time to live, um, with cancer or ALS and lots of comorbid uh, conditions associated with it. And then, importantly, that our intention in not putting in a feeding tube or not hydrating such a patient in these kinds of cases is simply to not do the treatment. That, that our intention is fulfilled when the patient is no longer or ha uh, receiving the treatment or it hasn't been initiated for the patient. So there's no connection between the patient and the feeding tube, then our intention um, is fulfilled. And under those circumstances, I think we tip, that's what we typically do, and I think it's morally permissible under those kinds of circumstances to withhold um, or withdraw um, a feeding tube or a central venous catheter or peripheral venous catheter or enterocolysis or whatever means one want to, uh, might want to suggest for um, providing hydration and nutrition for such patients. <clears throat> In other words, under those cases, it's an instance of allowing the patient to die. And what I mean by allowing to die uh, is acting, oh, acting with the uh, specific intention in acting of withholding or withdrawing an intervention that would interfere with the progression of a pre-existing lethal pathophysiologic state. And this is typically justified when the treatment is futile or excessively burdensome when the intention is that the treatment should cease, not that the patient should cease. And for those who worry um, about what their own intentions might be, you have to think of the sort of counterfactual case. Uh, were the patient to start breathing after you withdraw the ventilator, would you say, oh, I've failed, let me quick get a pillow to smother the patient because the patient is still breathing? Or would you say that I have um, fulfilled my intention that the patient and the ventilator are no longer uh, connected? Um, um, those are the kinds of conditions under which um, I think we can say that it is permissible uh, to allow a patient to die. Now, what's this voluntarily stopping eating and drinking? Well, first of all, it has to, by definition, involve a decisionally capable patient. Otherwise, the V wouldn't be there, right? It's got to be voluntary, right? So it's got to be someone who has the capacity to say uh, this is the case. And either uh, the patient doesn't have a lethal pathophysiologic condition, or there's, they're not at the very end stage of that lethal illness. Um, and my way of sort of thinking about that would be um, other things being equal, ceteris paribus, um, uh, but for the decision not to eat, that the patient could live for weeks to years. Right? Um, and there is no pathophysiological reason why the patient cannot eat. Um, there is no obstruction. There's no you know, evidence of neuromuscular dysfunction. And there's no pathologically explicable um, um, anorexia. Eating wouldn't be futile um, or dangerous. 
But the patient has judged that the burdens of being alive outweigh the benefits of eating and continuing to be alive. And the intention of the patient is to bring about his or her death by way of not eating. That's what I think um, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking um, means. Um, at least in, I'm going to define it as under these circumstances. Okay. Now, I want to suggest that it is not the withholding or withdrawing of a life-sustaining treatment. Right? Eating um, is not a medical treatment. Right? Um, I don't think most of you who think uh, that what you're getting from pot belly right now is a medical treatment. In fact, it's probably medically contraindicated for you. <laughs> right? Right? Um, secondly, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking doesn't meet um, if you just followed what I was saying, the traditional criteria we use for assessing that it's a case of allowing to die. Because the cause of the death, in this case, would not be an underlying pathophysiologic condition for which eating is a medically indicated treatment. Um, and the intention of the act is not that the treatment should cease, but that the patient should cease. Right? So it's not the typical case of voluntarily stopping uh, eating and drinking being a case of, uh, of typical uh, allowing to die the way I have defined both of those terms. Now, what's suicide? Uh, well, we can get a clue from other languages which are a bit more uh, direct about it. Uh, the German is Selbstmord, um, or self-killing. Um, that, of course, leads to the question of what is killing? Um, what does it mean to kill a human being? And here's my definition of what that means. It's acting with the specific intention and acting of creating a new lethal pathophysiologic state so that a human being should die by way of one's action. Now, there are lots of ways we can do this. We can stick a, a knife into someone's heart, right, and create a new lethal pathophysiologic condition of the hemorrhage that cause, that's, that's there. And if we do so with the intention that they're going to die by having done that, um, that uh, would be an instance of killing. Uh, likewise, if you put 150 milliequivalents of potassium chloride into somebody's right ventricle through a catheter, you are creating a new lethal pathophysiologic condition, uh, and I think the burden of proof would be on you as a physician to prove that your intention under such circumstances would be anything other than trying to make the patient dead. Um, and that's what I mean by killing. And it's traditionally justified um, only in cases of self-defense uh, or rescue. Um, um, where there's forced choice and certain death. Um, we, you might want, if you're a just war theorist, to expand the self-defense out to the defense of a nation uh, to justify killing uh, that way. Um, I have a harder time for those who try to make that same argument for, um, uh, for execution. I'm against capital punishment, but some people try to make that kind of a self-defense of the community argument uh, to do it. Um, but all of those would only be the exceptions in terms of uh, um, uh, acceptable killing. But in all of those cases, it's creating a new lethal pathophysiologic state in the patient with the specific intention that the patient should die by way of that action. So what is suicide? Suicide is doing that to yourself, right? Um, creating a new lethal pathophysiologic condition in yourself with the specific intention and in acting that you should die by way of the creation of that new pathophysiologic state. What counts? Um, well, it could be um, uh, those um, horrible and sad cases in which people put a gun to their heads, right? And they create a new lethal pathophysiologic state with the specific intention they should die by way of that action. Um, or people overdose on drugs with the specific intention that that overdose state should be toxic to them and they should die by, uh, by that. Those are the typical cases of suicide. By these definitions, it seems to me um, pretty clear um, that voluntarily stopping eating and drinking fits the definition of suicide. It is intentionally creating a new lethal pathophysiologic state that of starvation and dehydration with the specific intention and in acting of making oneself dead by way of that act. Right? Our normal physiology leads us to eat and maintain our um, uh, state of nourishment and hydration, um, and to voluntarily stop eating and drinking is to create a new lethal pathophysiologic state which wasn't there uh, before. And if one does so with the specific intention of making oneself dead by way of that act, 
It seems to me that that fits the definition of suicide. So what's assisted suicide? Again, it's aiding another person in suicide, aiding somebody else in their killing of themselves. Now, uh, 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 and when the person who does the aiding is a physician, we call it physician-assisted suicide. Um, in the uh, jurisdictions in which this is legal, uh, the physician writes a prescription for a lethal dose of uh, barbiturates, um, and the patient then takes those, if they um, carry it out with a specific intention in acting, of creating a new lethal pathophysiologic state within themselves of an overdose of barbiturates with a specific intention that they should die by way of that action. Um, and if the physician writes the prescription, the physician is actually then assisting uh, the patient um, in that suicide. What are the ways we can assist somebody um, uh, in something like that? Um, uh, one way is by suggesting um, the action. So uh, those of you who are familiar with the Hippocratic Oath, it says, I will not give a deadly drug to a patient even if asked, uh, nor make a suggestion thereto. Um, so the suggestion is actually 2,500 years ago um, sort of included in the ambit of the things that at least the Hippocratic Oath um, thought would be prescribed. Um, so suggesting it is a way of assisting. Giving instructions, here's how you do it. Providing sanctuary or cover for somebody is a way of assisting them in an action. Um, facilitating or easing the action is a way of assisting a person in their action or failing uh, to prevent when you've got a role-specific duty to prevent it is another way um, of assisting someone in an action that you consider to be um, a, a wrong action. So I think then, again, by these pretty simple, straightforward definitions, that voluntarily stopping eating and drinking is a form of physician-assisted suicide if the physician, for instance, encourages or suggests it, um, which again is becoming very common in the literature. You know you're not in a state where you can, I can give you a legal prescription, but you could stop eating and drinking if you'd like. Right? That is a form of assistance um, in this action which fits the definition of suicide. If you instruct the patient in how to do it, um, if you provide cover, for instance, misdirecting others who might intervene or persuade the patient to stop it, um, if you agree to ease possible accommodating symptoms by promising hospitalization or sedation, uh, you are assisting the patient in this action. Um, uh, if you do not um, attempt to dissuade uh, the patient or suggest alternatives in some ways, um, um, at least within the jurisdictions in which suicide, um, uh, physician-assisted suicide is uh, illegal, um, then you are actually assisting the patient in that because you have a role um, specific duty uh, not, to, uh, not to assist. This gets us, course, of course, into a complicated issue, which is the ethics of complicity, um, of being an accomplice in someone else's wrongdoing, uh, if one considers this to be wrong. And again, this is all a conditional argument. Um, so you can do that formally if you share the intention of the person so that you say, yes, I think you should do this. Um, I want you to, uh, to do it. I think it's best for you. Here's how to do it. Um, then you share the intention. Um, but even if you don't, um, you can be someone who supplies uh, the means, whether they're social or material. You can facilitate it. You can fail to prevent and be um, implicated in uh, the wrongdoing of another person. It's another whole lecture to go into on the ethics of, uh, of complicity, but these are the kinds of ways in which that could be the case. Therefore, and again, this is all conditional. I'm not arguing whether physician-assisted suicide is right or wrong, but if it is wrong, then physician-assisted voluntarily stopping eating and drinking is wrong. Um, I think it's simple deductive logic it's following standard definitions um, and ordinary language, um, and it baffles me that there has been a literature that suggests um, anything um, to the contrary. So what are the kinds of counter-arguments that people might come up with against this or ways of trying to justify it? Um, you know, that this sort of approach from me, and I alluded to this at the beginning, sort of lacks compassion, right? 
here, up here, you're this, just this guy with a philosophy uh, degree, even though you're a doctor. You know, but I want to suggest to you, I'm not Mr. Spock. You know, I don't have the pointy ears. Um, I can't even do the Vulcan mind meld. Um, I'm not guarded simply by logic. I care about my patients um, who have um, uh, these uh, diagnoses, and I want to care for them um, and accompany them through their, uh, uh, through their suffering. I'm not someone um, who is actually uh, prone to torturing patients, and I don't think that um, not participating in voluntarily stopping eating and drinking amounts to torturing patients. Um, I do think that compassion is important in medicine, but compassion um, needs some degree of reason to be true mercy, and I think we ought to show mercy um, for our uh, patients um, and not merely be guided only by our emotions. Um, emotions are important and we shouldn't be automatons, but it shouldn't just be emotions that guide everything. Um, now, I'll also tell you, in case you're thinking of it, this is not, I'm not going to give this lecture you know, to a patient um, who asks about voluntarily stopping eating and drinking any more than I'd give a lecture on viral epidemiology to a patient who, to whom I was disclosing a diagnosis of HIV. Right? I'm making a logical philosophical argument. I'm not prescribing for you how you should deal with this question um, in, a, uh, in a clinical, uh, clinical way where we have to be very um, careful and sensitive to the needs of our patients. Now, the counter, counter, counter argument from compassion might be this, you know? You know how could you turn away uh, a patient who had decided to do voluntary stopping eating and drinking and ask for your help with symptom management, you know? After all, you know, people do things that we think collectively are wrong and harm themselves, like smoking cigarettes, and we still give them bypass surgery, right? Um, is that complicity in their um, smoking? Um, or we give them nicotine patches when they're in the hospital, so we're sort of you know, um, uh, treating them in that sense when they've, got the, they've been doing things that we think are wrong and we want to help them. Um, my reply uh, to that would be first to, to point out that um, yeah, even though you might say um, people suggest that they commit suicide by uh, smoking, it's not as grave as the kind of suicide that I'm uh, talking about. But more importantly, that the bypass counterexample is not really analogous, right? Coronary artery disease is a consequence of this past action of um, smoking, um, not a present concomitant of an ongoing uh, wrongdoing that we are facilitating. Um, I don't think we have an obligation to help facilitate the smoking of our patients uh, because they refuse to quit by giving them lidocaine spray to ease the sore throat that it causes them when they smoke. Right? I don't think any of us think we have that um, obligation as, uh, as caregivers. So the, the counterexamples that people have tried to put up, I think, are actually um, misplaced. The better form of the general case of a counterexample, uh, of, of the general um, example here, would be who somebody says, I'd like to do X, which we consider to be wrong. X hurts me. Please ease the pain of my doing X, whatever it might be. For example, it might be, um, I presume most of you will agree with me, it's wrong to rob banks. Somebody says, I'd like to rob the bank, um, but the vault is electrified. It would give me a shock if I touched the, uh, the vault handle. Please turn off the electricity, right? That's the, that's the way in which one uh, is actually uh, facilitating um, the, the wrongdoing in those circumstances. Another counter argument, um, which has been um, mostly the one that Tim Quill puts forth, um, that we have an obligation not to abandon um, our patients, and I think that that's true. Um, and he would then say that to not help the patient who is uh, elected voluntarily stopping eating and drinking amounts to abandonment of the patient. A reply to that um, is that I think we ought to offer to continue to treat that patient under an alternative uh, plan of deeply compassionate care and accompaniment treating whatever symptoms um, uh, they, uh, they have to the best of our ability, um, uh, but, um, uh, but not going um, to the uh, step of, uh, of facilitating or participating in the patient's own plan. Um, I would point out um, that it is not necessary to see a physician in order to commit suicide. Right, so we don't have to be um, involved in this, and we don't even have to be involved in voluntarily stopping eating and drinking if that's ultimately what a patient uh, chooses. Um, but a physician um, um, and a nurse and any other healthcare professional, uh, all of us are independent moral agents, and we are not merely agents of the, the will of the patient. 
um, so that if we're going to do something, we have to do it together. Um, and if we have deep moral disagreement, I don't think there is a general moral obligation for us to participate in what we think is morally wrong. Another counter-argument that's uh, quite common is simply to reject the distinction between killing and allowing to die, right? That, you know, what's the difference between um, stopping um, a, a ventilator, um, stopping eating and drinking, and giving somebody a lethal injection? The patient's going to be dead at the end of the day, um, and that's the, uh, all that really counts is the end of their suffering, um, and there's no real meaningful distinction between killing and allowing to die. Uh, well, my you know, argument to that is that that means that the person is going to have to prove that I've made a logical error in setting up the distinction the way I have. Um, or they'd have to make an ethical argument that the distinction I've made marks no morally significant difference. And that's a very complicated set of arguments that um, you know, uh, we might get into. But at the end of the day, if there's somebody who actually does reject the distinction between um, killing and allowing to die, then there shouldn't be any moral objection to physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia anyway. So it shouldn't matter for such a person that voluntarily stopping eating and drinking is a form of suicide because they believe in physician, ought to believe in physician-assisted suicide anyway. Um, so it shouldn't matter to that kind of a person. Is physician assistance in voluntarily stopping eating and drinking legal, um, has, as has been um, uh, reported or, or, uh, or um, expressed in the literature on multiple occasions. Um, and I think the, um, uh, the guiding um, idea behind that is that physician assisted suicide is illegal in many jurisdictions, but you can't legally force a patient to accept a feeding tube, right, which is true. And therefore, we'll recommend voluntarily stopping eating and drinking as a legal form of physician-assisted suicide. And it should be OK, because we can't uh, force them. Uh, to, uh, we can't force feed them. Uh, my reply is that you know, I think that's morally disingenuous. Right? It's trading on uh, ambiguities. Um, it's trying to get around um, uh, the law and trying to say that this is something different from physician-assisted suicide, uh, just because there seems to be a cover for it. Um, and secondly, that there really isn't any case law to support this. So um, there hasn't been a case in which anyone has attempted to prosecute somebody for, um, for helping a patient with voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. It may not happen anyway, but I don't think people can make the claim that it is legal when there is no statutory law that says it's legal and there's no case law uh, to suggest that it wouldn't be possible to prosecute this as an instance of uh, physician-assisted suicide in jurisdictions in which it is um, um, illegal, uh, particularly if one does other things. Yes? I'm saying that if a physician doesn't put in um, the, f uh, the, f uh, the, f the feeding tube um, and would probably have to do other kinds of things, like you know, bring the patient into the hospital, sedate them, et cetera, you know, which is the sort of full guns, right? Uh, that um, it, you know, it may be that someone could prosecute such a person for, uh, uh, for, um, uh, for physician-assisted suicide. There's no case law. There's no, uh, it would be probably tough, which is, what, you know, which is why, you know, even if you define it morally a as physician-assisted suicide, it's going to be very hard to prosecute, right? Because it would be so ambiguous in those circumstances. But I think somebody might you know, uh, 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 possibly try to do so. Um, and if they did, you can't necessarily say that you've you know, got cover from it, because that could be defined by a very zealous you know, uh, a person as a, an instance of physician-assisted suicide. So uh, there just is no case law. Uh, I agree it would be difficult to prove, which is part of why people want to do this, but I don't think they can make the absolute claim they have that it is legal. So how far do I think, and this maybe gets to more the point of your uh, question, Dan, one ought to go when a patient refuses voluntarily stopping eating and, and drinking and one is morally opposed? Um, the first thing I think we always ought to do is to assess that patient for depression, um, for altered decisional uh, capacity, um, whatever the cause might be. Um, secondly, I think we uh, would be obliged to share um, our opposition with them in um, a uh, in, a, in a humane and, um, and compassionate way, um, that I think we would have an obligation as persons who are opposed to assisted suicide uh, to try to dissuade them from doing so, 
uh, that we ought to offer them alternatives um, for whatever symptoms or fears they might have. Um, we ought to recognize that a physician is ultimately not necessary for suicide, particularly this form of suicide. Um, I don't think we should admit them uh, to the hospital if we're opposed to um, uh, by euthanasia and assisted suicide. I don't think we should prescribe sedation for them, make house calls to see that everything is going okay. Um, I don't think, and this is where Dan comes up, that we should force feed such a person. Um, I would not uh, do that unless there was a reason to believe that the patient lacked capacity, like they were severely depressed. I thought we could treat the depression um, and then get them back to a state in which they would want to be able uh, to eat. Um, and I think I would hold physicians disciplinarily responsible for assisting um, um, in jurisdictions where physician assisted suicide was illegal. Um, and that would include uh, the, leaving open the possibilities of prosecution or um, uh, um, the possibility of discipline within um, a medical organization if one wants to really go uh, that far. Um, we can you know, debate that, but, um, but I, would, uh, I would go as far as that. Um, uh, yes. Well, it would be only, you know, we'll get to these questions in a minute. I think it would only be under the case in which they lack decisional capacity, right? So you could do, you could do that. Um, and maybe we'll get through some of these other possible related cases that might get to it, you know? Um, so, um, so the kind of related cases um, that I wanted to bring up um, are um, an incomplete suicide attempt, right? Um, so the suicide is attempted, let's say, by somebody with lye ingestion. They survive, but the esophagus is severely damaged. The patient lacks capacity due to their underlying uh, depression, so they could be involuntarily um, admitted to the hospital when would treat the depression. And then in this case, you'd actually probably, to feed them, have to do a G-tube unless you had very good people who could get through the, uh, the, the caustic injury without damaging the esophagus. And I think a few, cardio a few gastroenterologists in the room who probably uh, wouldn't do that. Um, um, so I think you'd probably have to be surgical, or if you thought it was short-term enough, you could do maybe um, uh, parenteral feeding for such a person. Another related case, and I've uh, been interested in the way psychiatrists uh, you know, uh, think about this, um, anorectics, right? Um, um, I don't think that most psychiatrists put feeding tubes into patients with anorexia um, um, for willy-nilly, um, but while the patient has, certainly while the patient has any capacity for reason, they would try to persuade that patient and treat them, treat comorbidities such as depression, um, but I think if lack of eating leads to a lack of capacity, that's the point at which um, one would then um, uh, involuntarily commit that patient and um, feed them to restore capacity and, uh, and continue psychotherapy. Um, another related case, which I think is even more complicated, is that of hunger strikes, right? Um, because there we have to presume that the person who's doing it is decisionally capable. Um, but it's complicated because it's a form, actually, of political speech to be engaging in a hunger strike. And it's also complicated by the fact these persons are under the custodial care of the state. Um, we're reluctant to force feed. I'd be reluctant to force feed prisoners under these cases. Um, but I'm always perplexed by that, uh, if you ever saw that movie, Some Mother's Son, about the IRA hunger strikers and Helen Mirren's uh, um, character who... Um, uh, when her son loses capacity, says, stop the madness, and then all the other mothers come out and they actually force feed these uh, IRA, uh, IRA prisoners. Um, and there's some reasonability, I think, um, and, um, um, to that kind of, uh, a kind of a reaction. So I don't know where I come out on that, but I think it's not sufficiently analogous to the voluntarily stopping eating and drinking that we're talking about. So my conclusions, the basic ones, um, and we can you know, discuss a little at the edges, are that voluntarily stopping eating and drinking um, is not the same as withholding or withdrawing life-sustaining treatment. Right? Eating is part of our normal physiology. And that voluntarily stopping eating and drinking is then a form of suicide, creating a new lethal pathophysiologic uh, condition within oneself uh, with a specific intention and acting of making oneself dead by way of that action. A physician who assists with voluntarily stopping eating and drinking is there, uh, therefore doing physician-assisted suicide um, um, on the definitions of those. And if physician-assisted suicide is wrong, 
um, then physician-assisted voluntarily stopping eating and drinking um, would be wrong as well. Again, I have not established, and we can argue at some other point, that physician-assisted suicide is wrong. This has all been a conditional argument. Um, if you want my arguments against that, you can tune in on Thursday, November 13th on Intelligence Squared, uh, which gets, I think, um, uh, uh, live uh, um, uh, computer airplay and then is re uh, reproduced on NPR stations. But Peter Singer and Andrew Solomon will be debating me and Baroness Elora Finlay, who's a palliative care doctor and member of the House of Lords in the, uh, in the UK, and we'll be debating the question of physician-assisted uh, suicide. Um, but um, I'd, if, I'd like to have the questions, at least before we get into physician-assisted suicide, be um, solely on the question of whether physician-assisted voluntary stopping eating and drinking is physician-assisted suicide or not, rather than whether physician-assisted suicide is right or wrong. But we can get into that later. So questions, uh, concerns, objections, um, I'm um, happy to uh, answer um, and entertain all, any and all. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Solomancy. Um, we have time for questions. Yep. We can... We're supposed to sit. This is, the, this is the way we're supposed to uh, do it here, is sit here. You, I guess you get the, uh, okay, no. You, okay, I take the microphone and you, you point out who gets the questions, yes. Very clearly reasoned. Um, where I get caught up is the, the active-passive distinction. Mm -hmm. and, and I see shooting yourself actively mm -hmm. as, as more suicidal than passively not continuing to eat and drink. Mm -hmm. and, and also, I see sedating somebody as more active than not preventing them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the suicide and the assistance part, I think mm -hmm. I see a distinction there. Yeah, yeah the active, uh, um, this is more generally on the distinction between killing and allowing to die, right? The active-passive distinction you know, can't really mark the moral distinction, right? Um, because there are certainly cases in which one could um, um, have a, a moral obligation, um, role responsibility to help somebody and not do so, right? So if I am a lifeguard and somebody is drowning um, and um, I know that if they uh, drown, uh, they're going to give um, uh, a million, if they're dead, their will says they're going to give a million dollars to the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, and I just stand there with my hands behind my back, um, then my not acting there, my, pass, my passivity, is in fact, I think most people would judge, and I think you would agree, morally wrong, right? So the, so the, the active-passive distinction does not mark itself um, the moral um, distinction, right? Killing will always be active, um, but um, the way I look at the logic of it, and I guess I have a, have a slide on this, um, <clears throat> I think, um, anticipating, I guess, this question might come up, um, um, is, yes, that all killing um, would be morally wrong, except in cases of self-defense and rescue, right? But some allowing to die is morally permissible, right? And some is not, right? And some of the, um, some of the morally impermissible, um, you know, uh, allowing to die is when one has a nefarious motive and acts for these other sorts of, uh, sorts of reasons. So, so you can't make it just on um, the, um, uh, the active-passive distinction. It's got to be a little more than that. Um, I have a mic. To continue on that, on that vein, it seems to me that the difference between shooting yourself and voluntarily stopping ingestion is that you can hedge your bet until the point where you become unconscious. Mm -hmm. And that the reason to me that sedating that person is wrong is that you, you've pushed him along that continuum. Mm -hmm. You've taken away the ongoing decisional capacity actively, even though the patient asked for that. So that's, that's my take on that. I'm always puzzled by the issue of depression. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that, to, just to take a public example of David Foster Wallace, someone who has been treated repeatedly, repeatedly, and has come to think of the depression as an illness that will never remit, that whose treatment is futile and onerous and causes him more suffering, that, that, that's, that it's, it's a little bit facile to say that suffering is something I should always intervene in and another kind, and, and that that suffering alone takes away decisional capacity it seems to me that it may be a very good reason to commit suicide, mm 
in that sort of situation. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll agree that there are plenty uh, of different ways to uh, uh, bring about one's death, and, and that you know some of some of which are slower and would you know admit of the possibility of uh, of reversal. Um, I think the same kind of thing happens um, in um, in a lot of drug overdoses, and and there's certainly you know the psychiatrists in the room know that for many people it's actually a jet more a gesture right than it is actually um, a, a suicidal uh, um, um, intent at the end and people can be rescued from uh, from those sorts of things so the ways in which it doesn't it doesn't change the moral structure if your real intention is to make yourself dead and that continues to be the case all the way through until you are dead then uh, then the moral structure is the same re regardless of whether the uh, pathophysiologic state is occur occurs quickly or, or not. But I'll agree with you that, that um, certainly there are chances to change your mind if you're doing something slower. You know, if you're giving yourself a little bit of arsenic every day, you know, and uh, you, could, you could stop at some, uh, at some point, I, and I uh, uh, could agree with that. So it's a little less dangerous and less quick, but it doesn't, it doesn't in the end change the intentional uh, structure. With regard to um, uh, uh, suicide and decisional capacity, um, you know, not all, per and, and, uh, and depression, not all persons who are depressed lose decisional capacity, right? So um, uh, the, uh, the person uh, uh, who is uh, uh, depressed and suicidal um, generally is so because they have um, a distortion in their judgment, right? They think that um, the world is um, awful, would be better off without them, um, at, you know, et, et cetera, but they have at least enough capacity to know what would happen if they put the gun to their, uh, to their heads. But, but it's, it usually hangs a lot on their judgment um, uh, in those circumstances. So, so you're correct to say that not everybody who's depressed has thereby lost decisional capacity. Somebody, there are lots of people who are depressed who still have decisional decisional capacity. Yes, Dan, yeah. yeah. I have a little difficulty with the, the notion of uh, the phrase allowing patients to die. And I think it's used, uh, it's often used um, to, um, I think it, it sort of gives the physician sort of this illusion of power which is not existing. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, should we do CPR or allow the patient to die? Mm -hmm. Which really it's, should we you know, allow the patient to die now or in 20 minutes from now. Right, right. And very often, that's what allowing the patient to die is. And I think that needs to be separated from the real thing of, of a patient who we're allowing to die because they're going to do something that's really going to, you know, end in their death. So there's really different yeah. concepts of, yeah. I think you need to parse out that allowing yeah. to die thing because yeah. it's, it's so overused and it's, it really makes... It, it, it really empowers physicians to this degree that I think is not warranted. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, within allowing to die, there are some of the justifications which are uh, futility, right? Uh, which sort of, uh, which, which in some ways you're pointing out is oxymoronic, right? To sort of say, right, sort of say, you know, uh, right, they're dying anyway. It's more a recognition that they are, that yeah. they are dying, yes. But there are other cases in which, um, you know, uh, life could be prolonged um, fairly substantially, in which we might allow someone to die. Let's say there's somebody who's um, a paraplegic and ventilator d dependent, right? And we uh, honor the choice of that person to discontinue the, um, uh, or quad quadriplegic, sorry, and, and we allow that person to uh, discontinue the ventilator under those circumstances. I mean, that is a little bit more of allowing to die in a, a sort of sense, a stricter sense that you want uh, 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 to use it. Um, both of which I think are distinct from uh, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking in which there is no underlying pathophysiologic condition you know, which would in, uh, but for the stopping and eating, eating and drinking result in the patient's death within a very short period of time. Who's got uh, Mike left? So you're, you're supposed to be uh, helping Christian and, you know, so. Um, I think we have a, we have a question over here. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Great uh, talk. Very logical. Um, if, try. as usual. I try. <laughs> exactly. um, it seems to me that your, th this whole lattice work hinges on intention. And, and I would argue that intention isn't always clear or unambiguous. And it seems to me that 
there, there could be times and places, uh, the case that you gave of 75-year-old, I mean, there are two different kinds of variables with that intentionality. One is over the course of her condition, that individual person, by even your own argument, she will reach a point where you believe it is an appropriate kind of thing not to continue to eat. I mean, that, that is a predicted outcome for her. And she knows that ahead of time. And we have enough knowledge mm -hmm. and predictive value. So it seems to me that actually changes her intentionality. Mm -hmm. She could look around and say, well, I'm going to be using a lot of resources, and that's futile in my, ult my ultimate end. Or she say, I may have lived a happy life, and this is how my God or my you know, fate has, has destined for me to go. Yeah. And so her intentionality may not be to take her own life, but to accept this condition that's progressing and to hand off her resources to other people, to not, you know, so her intentionality may not be to die, but to accept this condition and to not take resources from the young. And so um, that would really change her yeah, your you have to, rubric. Yeah, but you have to be careful to distinguish, distinguish intention from motive, right? Um, so motives are, can, uh, motives are distinct from intentions, right? Um, they can be the sort of furthest intention one has, but they're often posterior motives. Like revenge is a motive, right, of something that happened in the past. And we also may have, you know, uh, you know, wider motives for doing something. And, you know, generosity towards others would be a good motive. What I'm talking about is the specific intention in acting. So what fulfills the intention of the patient who says, um, um, I want to die now, right? Um, uh, within the next two, two weeks, I'm going to stop eating and drinking so that, right, as a further intention, other people might use the resources. So that uh, initial intention becomes, the, has to be intended because it is the means by which she's achieving the further intention, which is, you know, perhaps her, uh, her motive. Um, so you've got to be very careful to distinguish motive, from, uh, from intention in these sorts of things. But, but that requires you to say that her taking the food is morally obligatory. Because otherwise she could say, no, my intention is to not consume resources. And I know that a secondary consequence of that. Well, then you've got, then you've got to sort of uh, uh, ask people, you know, you, know, re, you know, reason, right? So right. Um, again, this is logic. Is it logically possible to say that my intention is not to uh, kill myself, but is only to re remove myself as a user of resources that would be used by other people by making myself dead, but I don't actually intend myself to be dead? That yeah. seems to be illo actually illogical because one is the means by which the other is being achieved, um, and, um, and, and you really can't sustain that. Nor can you sort of, um, which often happens, and people like Tim Quill try to do this, change the morality of something by, you know, or the intention by act redescription. So um, take two examples. These are common in the philosophical literature. Um, Oedipus marries Jocasta, and Oedipus marries his mother. Right? Um, if Oedipus um, knows that uh, Jocasta is his mother, then he can't say, I intend um, to marry this woman named Jocasta, but I don't under, under, undertake the intention to marry my mother, even though I know that those are two different descriptions of the same event, right? So you can't be disingenuous that way either if you're going to be serious about these things. No, because they would be the same effects. So there's no double effect, right? And, and in this case here, the means that the, one of the conditions in double effect is that the end cannot be achieved by the means, right? So, yeah, so if the means of, of redistributing resources by making oneself dead, then it's not double effect because um, you're intending that means to towards the other uh, towards the other end. So it, it makes it uh, it, make, it violates the third condition of the rule of double effect. What uh, concerns me is that sometimes we as Oedipus pretend and try not <laughs> yes. to know whether it was our mother or it was not our mother, and we do things which is not rational. Say uh, we help someone not to be eating. Uh, we know that that person wants to commit suicide. And so we say as if, you know, we should help him based on compassion or not. But the basic question is whether or not we believe in committing suicide is a person's right or it is not. Mm -hmm. And what puzzles me, you may find very rational people like Kant, mm -hmm. 
who is so rational and he believes that the autonomy is the sole purpose of moral yeah. or is the origin of moral. And on the other hand, he says uh, that committing suicide is wrong. Or you, for example, give such a good lecture, but at the end I didn't find out whether you are in favor of suicide or not. <laughs> and uh, so I just wonder if you are courageous enough to yes. say yes, yes or no, or yes. would you let me keep yes. thinking? Sure. No, I'm, uh, I'm opposed, and what I did say is you'll, you'll find out more about why I'm opposed if you want to tune in on November 13th, so. but I'm opposed, yes. But the argument that I made was conditional. So it's just sort of calling a spade a spade, if, even if you are in favor. So, Dan, yes. Um, thanks for a great, clear, um, really lo marvelously lucid lecture. Um, it reminds me, as a good lecture does, that philosophy is hard. Mm -hmm. And that um, it's really hard not to have a view that's over or under inclusive. And I wonder whether even from your own perspective, this one might be over-inclusive. And I wonder whether some of your distinctions are attempts that need more sort of development to try to keep that from happening. So as Peter says, w w one of the fulcrums here is um, the concept of intention. Mm -hmm. And um, intention is understood to be, to refer to the description under which one performs an action. Um, so, and that doesn't mean um, that actions that you know will lead to your death are therefore suicide. Mm -hmm. um, when the soldier throws himself on the grenade to save um, uh, his comrades, his intention and actions to save his comrades, mm -hmm. not to kill himself. So even though he knows he will die. Um, and si so similarly, um, uh, some of these other kinds of examples mm -hmm. um, might be handled by simply pointing out that suicide is not the intention in action, mm -hmm. or it could also be the case that because it has downstream effects, it's justified even if it is suicide. Mm -hmm. But when you focus on intention this way, um, and then on the other notion of um, a sort of a wide notion of assisting, um, I'm concerned with two very general, with one general thing and one more specific kind of case. The general one has to do with the thought that it looks to me as if all sorts of decisions to stop care, even under conditions in which someone will die imminently, count as suicide mm -hmm. because uh, in many of those cases the accurate intention, mm -hmm. description of the intention of the patient is to die. Mm -hmm. um, their reasons may have to do with stopping pain okay. and so forth, but, but the correct description of what mm -hmm. they're trying to bring about is their own death. Um, and uh, so I'm not at all clear why a lot of what you have there, distinguishing actions that involve imminent from actions that involve longer term um, mm -hmm. demises really mm -hmm. are relevant. But in the same way, um, it seems to me then that also the concept of aiding that you're using um, is a broad one. Um, and you're doing that because you think there are a lot of things physicians do in the way of counseling, in the way of you know, winking the eye and so forth that you think um, for, for, for patients who are uh, attempting to mm -hmm. um, stop s f food and nutrition, that those two count as aiding. Mm -hmm. And it looks to me that with that notion of intention and that notion of aiding, that if I wish to have my ventilator removed, and let's, to make it easy, imagine that I could live 20 more years, but the condition in which I'm in is intolerable to me. That looks like it counts as suicide, mm -hmm. yeah. and it looks as if removing the ventilator counts as aiding. Mm -hmm. I understand that you could describe the physician's intention in that case, um, not as trying to bring about the patient's death. Um, but nonetheless, it seems to me that can also, there are ways in which I think it might be accurate to say that physicians who assist um, patients who are trying to stop fluid and uh, um, 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 nutrition are not best seen as as intending to bring about the patient's death, um, but intending something else which might seem um, perfectly acceptable. So um, it looked as if the distinction you wanted to make to cover this case is that in some way having a breathing tube doesn't 
sort of moves you out of the realm of engaging in a standard natural activity, um, whereas eating and drinking are in some way natural activities. And that's where I'm wondering whether that's not a cogent move. Breathing is a pretty natural activity. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be misled by the fact that breathing tubes are large things. As you know, the technology increases, they could be tiny um, so that the patient could look as if there's nothing going on. And so I'm, it does look to me as if your argument entails that removing a breathing tube is physician-assisted suicide. And since I think yeah. you believe that removing a breathing tube under appropriate conditions is morally permissible, um, it looks as if there's a tension going on there. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, lots of questions buried within your uh, comments, and you know, probably the, uh, the, the, the next book is going to be an attempt to sort of work out most of those. But I have a fair uh, um, set of answers to some of it. Um, first, there's a distinction between intention and acting and further intentions, right? So what I'm limiting the moral responsibility to here is the intention in acting and not to the further intentions. That, of course, requires um, uh, also um, a moral distinction between intention and foresight, um, which also needs to be justified. Um, I take a lot of this from, uh, from Michael uh, Bratman, Intentions, Plans, and Rational Action, um, in terms of the action theory that's going on here, a little bit of John Searle as well. Um, and so, uh, um, but I'm, I'm giving it more of a moral valence. They were simply talking about it in terms of philosophy of mind. Um, so what I'm limiting it to is what are the conditions of fulfillment of, what, of one's intention in acting. Um, and that is fulfilled, as in the case of Karen Ann Quinlan, when the patient and the ventilator were, dis, uh, you know, were disconnected from each other, right? Um, you could um, have the belief that the patient was going to die, right? That was your foresight. You could have uh, the desire that the patient would, would die, um, but your, um, the court's order was fulfilled um, and the intention in acting was fulfilled when the patient and the ventilator uh, were discontinued. Um, and, that's, and that's where I'm you know, hanging the, the sort of most significant moral weight. It also requires, as you're suggesting, though this intention foresight distinction, and that requires separate um, you know, philosophical defense as well in terms of its. Well, no, it's, it's well, it's yes. So you know, that's the other part of the answer, and we'll probably get onto others. It's not just intention, right? So the complex definition of killing requires the, you know, and allowing to die requires something about knowing about the state of the patient, whether there is a pre-existing pathophysiologic condition, where there is a treatment which is stopping the progress of that. So it's, it's not just intention in which this distinction hangs, but several variables which are built into the, uh, into the definition. You're right if it's only intention um, that your arguments um, it would have some cogency, but it's not just intention that matters. More than intention matters. I'm sure you're going to be able to elucidate this better than I'm going to be in presenting it. When we look at the comment about active and passive that was earlier, and then what physicians do, and your inquiry on let's stay on the issue of physician-assisted suicide, when I juxtaposition Atul Gawande's conference last week, and the information, either in his book, I read it, or he delivered it, he said that we end up taking patients to surgery many times when their benefit from that surgery, we now have collected data, is inverse to what we intend to do, meaning the surgery that they get in the last 24 hours usually accelerates their death, and in the last six months of life, many of the things we do where we expend resources are futile. So how would you answer a question on intention and looking at the cold scalpel as arguably okay, but the warm, soft removal not okay, because I'm grappling with all of the actions that a physician takes, not the singular restriction or voluntary assistance of removing eating and drinking. 
Uh, part of your question is, do we, in fact, um, um, undertake a lot of interventions with our, which are either futile um, or um, more burdensome than beneficial at the end of life? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, and am I um, in favor of desisting from those uh, um, uh, interventions, um, or at least, uh, at the very least, letting patients know um, more clearly that the benefits are that uh, limited, and in some cases not even offering them because they are so futile, then the answer for me is a resounding yes. Um, so I'm not uh, somebody who's saying we have to, and that's not the point of this, is to say we have to treat patients. I'm totally in favor of withholding and withdrawing um, life-sustaining treatments that are futile or more burdensome than beneficial, including surgery, um, which may be um, undertaken with um, you know, the intention of making the patient's life uh, uh, better. Um, then we get into another whole part, which is the book after the book after, which is on self-deception. But that's another, uh, uh, another issue altogether. So. But I also yeah. want to follow up with, you know, there's this pathophysiological spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so one could argue that we know that as patients are aging, mm -hmm. there is a decrement in their in ability to eat and drink. As they go along, one of the final things you see, whether it's a cancer patient, patient with Alzheimer's, the intake decreases. So we could say that in some way, we are doing sedation or accommodating what is a natural process. How would you answer that in a philosophical construct? It could be the moral equivalent of giving Tylenol for pain. No, again, if, if a patient has reached the end stages of a disease, um, um, as is often the case in patients with end stages of malignancies, um, end stages of, uh, of tuberculosis, untreated HIV, I mean, you know, what's one of the, you know, the things that happens to people is they lose their appetites. It's part of the natural process um, of dying. Generally, that's not painful, and I suspect our palliative care doctor here would tell us that there's um, you know, not much of an indication in those cases for giving morphine for, uh, for that. But if the patient did have some sort of discomfort which required treatment, then I'd be you know, more than happy under those cases to give them that treatment. But they have a pathophysiological reason to explain uh, the fact that they um, are not eating under those circumstances. Yeah, there might be other causes. There might be other causes of pain which are due to comorbidities um, as well. Maybe we should go on to another question, or if we've got, uh, I don't know, much more time. Yeah, there's not enough, not enough time. Okay. Do we have one more question? One final question? One more from one Robert. More right. yeah. You get two. Yeah. So I'm thinking about other. <coughs> I'm sort of resisting your point of view, and I'm, I'm trying to identify what's making me resistant. Part of it is that I think, you know, by nature we're all dying, and eating and drinking keeps us alive, which is kind of artificial. So in a way, letting ourselves die is kind of letting nature take its course. That's kind of the default fate of all of us. So that's, that's one piece. Um, an another piece is that I'm interested in your, in your exceptions. For example, self-defense is an exception. Mm -hmm. Could you frame voluntary, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking as kind of a self-defense against this inexorable cognitive decline, yeah. for example, in your case? Okay. You know, so the, so the, or, first thing, or, the first thing on, you know, on, um, back, you know uh, on the sort of natural, the unnaturalness of, uh, of eating, I guess it depends on what you're eating and maybe justifies the natural food, uh, food movement. But, um, you know, I just have recently have a cat and I wish I could get this cat to stop the natural process of eating as much as it seems to, uh, uh, to want to, which is part of, uh, I think, you know, our natural tendencies as, uh, as organisms. Um, we exist by, uh, by eating. Actually, Leon Cast has a wonderful book just on, uh, just on eating and how the boundary between organism and, um, uh, and environment depends on some intake continually of uh, things from the, uh, from the external environment, which is, the mean, in some ways, the most primitive 
meaning of, uh, of eating, um, and it's part of the, you know, the, the law-like generalizations and typical history and features which characterize any um, living um, biological being as, a, as, a, as the kind of thing that it is. So I think that that's how I would say that it's natural. The argument about self-defense depends you know, on a, uh, really on a dualism that I won't accept, which is that I am something different from myself and therefore, you know, or from my suffering and can, uh, that's going on inside me and that I can sort of defend myself um, from myself in this sort of complex way. And I, I, I just don't buy that kind of you know, disembodied uh, person defen uh, uh, defending itself against the, uh, the bodied person who's suffering. I just don't buy that uh, philosophically. So. And, and, and I'm thinking about hunger strikes, like if political speech is maybe okay, yeah. um, why can't you see the voluntary stopping as not just political speech, but a political decision? Yeah. Well, suicide, I mean, have, suicide is always, suicide is always, and this I learned from Ned Kasson, actually, uh, you know, suicide is always an act of communication. Uh, it is always an act of communication. And he says that his question before someone asked about, and, and the idea that it's a purely self-regarding action is nonsense, right? His, his question for patients, he said, who were contemplating suicide was always, in whose closet do you intend to leave your skeleton, right? The person who's committing suicide is always saying something. Um, I agree with that. Um, the question is, do we want to allow them to have um, that as the, as the final thing that they say about themselves or about others. Um, and um, and um, I'm, uh, I would rather say, uh, or they're just sort of testing the waters to say, does anybody care enough to try to stop me? Um, um, I care enough to try to stop people. All right, maybe that's uh, a final note, so thank you. Thank you.